Good afternoon, I'm Connor Batigan from Sandyford Business District. This afternoon's uh, session is on economic forecasting and agile innovation, it's very apt and appro appropriate for the times we're in at the moment. Um, and first up, I'm delighted to welcome Jim Power, a lecturer, Michael Smurfett Graduate School of Business, UCD. Uh, as an owner of an economic and financial research uh, consultancy, Jim provides a range of services including public speaking, lecturing, media interviews and commentary. During a career within the financial services industry, he has worked as Treasury econo econo Economist uh, at AIB and Chief Economist at Bank of Ireland Group Treasury. He is currently Chief Economist with Friends First Group and Chairman of both Three Rock Capital Management and Love Irish Food. Jim, you're very welcome. You're going to give us, hopefully, hopefully, a positive economic outlook. Okay, um, thank you very much, Connor. Um, I, I can't promise the hopeful bit, but I'll give you a realistic assessment of where I, I see us at the moment. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to thank the Sandyford Business District um, to invite me to speak at their Innovation Week. Delighted to do it. What I intend doing over the next 20 minutes I'm going to look at the international, just, you know, what the, um, the international environment is going to look like, okay? And um, then I am going to look at the domestic economic background, what's happening there. And then finally, I want to bring it down to the local, okay? Um, I think I'm getting a message that I'm a bit loud, so I better... Okay, is that better? Okay, um, hopefully the sound level is better at that stage. I was getting a message that I was being too loud. As I say, I want to first of all look at the international, because um, obviously as a small open economy where international trade and where foreign direct investment is so important to the economy, um, what's happening the world economy you know, is, is very, very important. Um, 2019 was a challenging year for the world economy. Uh, we saw a significant slowdown everywhere, the United States, China. Um, coming into 2020, I certainly was more optimistic about the future because I believed that a hard Brexit would be avoided. I believed that Trump and his trade war with China would lose momentum ahead of the US presidential election on the 3rd of November. And by the end of February, all of those things were happening and certainly we were being set up for a better year ahead for the world economy. Not dramatic, but a, a modest improvement in activity. And then, of course, everything changed in early March when we got the um, United Nations declaring a global pandemic. Um, we saw a dramatic impact on the world economy very, very quickly. Um, thankfully, we saw an incredibly quick, strong, coordinated global response interest rates were slashed everywhere. Um, central banks engaged in quantitative easing, pumping money into the global financial system with the sole aim really of keeping government bond yields down. And that facilitated the other part of the global response, which was fiscal policy, in other words, governments. And we've seen all over the world, and we saw a prime example of it in Ireland last Tuesday, well, Tuesday week now, with the annual budget. Um, basically, the European Union has cast aside the fiscal rules which limit borrowing. They have cast aside state aid rules and they have basically encouraged all member countries to engage in significant fiscal expansion. So cut taxes where possible, but more particularly increase government spending dramatically. So as I say, we've seen 
um, this very strong global response. All governments are borrowing and spending around the world, particularly in the European Union. Interest rates will remain and will have to remain at rock bottom levels for the foreseeable future. You know, as the global economy reopened from sort of April, May onwards, we saw a very strong rebound in economic activity everywhere. But of course, um, it's now starting to be undermined again by the recurrence of the virus. Um, many countries around the world, including ourselves, are having to put back in place significant restrictions on business activity, on economic activity, and of course, on social activity. So, you know, obviously, uh, that the challenge for the world economy, the next 12, 18 months, is going to be determined by the path of the virus. And really, until um, either a safe and effective vaccine is delivered, or until um, we get medicinal treatment of the virus, you know, obviously, it, it is going to have a significant impact on global economic activity. Another issue is the US election on the 3rd of November. Um, I, I could talk about that for the next 20 minutes, I'd better not. But I think suffice to say that Biden victory would be better for Ireland from a number of reasons. One, this very confrontational global trade approach that Trump had, has, excuse me, does not suit a small open economy like Ireland. And the second piece is the corporation tax one. Biden has said he would increase the corporation tax rate in the States from 21 to 28 percent. That, of course, makes Ireland a more attractive location for um, U.S. foreign direct investment in Europe. So um, the next couple of weeks will be incredibly interesting in that regard. Uh, Brexit is obviously a significant major source of uncertainty at the moment. And um, I will talk about that more in this, this slide, actually. As you know, the UK left the European Union on the 31st of January, went into a transition period, which ends on the 31st of December. During that transition period, the UK is still maintaining all of the same economic and trading relationships with the European Union, although it is not a member of the EU formally. And this transition period was put in place to facilitate um, the negotiations of a future trading arrangement between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, October 15th, um, which is a week ago at this stage almost, was a key date in the sense that Boris Johnson had said some time back that if a deal had not been agreed by 15th of October, well then Britain would walk away from the transition mechanism without a deal. And on the 1st of January next, World Trade Organization um, trade tariffs would apply to trade between the European Union and the United Kingdom, and obviously, as part of the United, as part of the European Union, between Ireland and um, the UK, uh, the mood music out of the negotiations has been pretty negative, really, since they began back in April. Um, there is still a significant risk that Britain will exit on the 31st of December and that WTO tariffs would apply from the following day. Um, I have always believed and I continue to believe, uh, perhaps foolishly or naively at this stage, but I still believe it, that we will get some sort of deal at the end of the day. It'll be a watered down compromise, but it would avoid Britain um, entering into WTO trading arrangements. Uh, that is obviously the sort of outcome Ireland desires at this juncture. But whether we get, okay, WTO trade tariffs would represent the worst outcome. But um, even if a deal is done, you, you'd, you'd still have to think that the, well, sorry, I don't think it's, I think it's a fact that Ireland's trading relationship with the UK for business will definitely become more complicated. The sector of the Irish economy most exposed is the agri-food sector. Okay, so um, moving on to what has happened to the Irish economy, you know, we've, we've obviously seen a dramatic decline in economic activity after March as large swathes of our economy were shut down. The Irish government, facilitated by the European Union, um, sorry, I skipped forward there, OK, uh, the, the Irish government, um, along with the European Union, is accepting that higher deficits, budget deficits will have to be run for the foreseeable future. And I suppose a sense of consolation for Ireland is that we are not alone. 
what we did in the budget last week is what every country in Europe is doing at the moment and indeed around the world. They're spending lots of money to protect their their businesses, their households from the ravages of COVID-19. And, um, you know, there's an acceptance that that's going to have to continue for the foreseeable future. And I think there's also an acceptance and indeed the International Monetary Fund has accepted this in recent times that fiscal austerity cannot follow this that the most important thing now is to try and rebuild our economy to make sure as many businesses as possible survive so as that when we do come out the other end of this COVID crisis, whenever that will be, that we will have um, a strong business sector, that we will have financially viable households and so on. And thankfully, from an Irish perspective, um, there is no problem running the sorts of deficits we're running because our international credibility is good and um, we're able to borrow at very, very low rates of interest, which is facilitated by the European Central Bank's quantitative easing program. Um, I think an important factor is that in the last 12 months, we've seen, particularly in the first half of this year, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in household deposits in the first six months of the year up by almost 8 billion to a record high of 112 billion almost. That's There's an element of precautionary saving there, but there's also an element of people who are still earning lots of money. There's many sectors of the economy still doing very well. Um, the, the wherewithal to spend money is obviously very, very limited. So there is this buildup of deposits, which eventually, once we come back to some sort of normality, that money will come back into the economy. So there will be, in my view, a significant consumer rebound um, once consumers have the ability to do that. Another thing that's become very clear this year is that the foreign direct investment base, particularly the chemical and pharmaceutical sector, um, is proving an incredibly important anchor for the economy at the moment, both in terms of the export performance and more particularly in terms of the strong growth in corporation tax receipts. And it is that strong growth in corporation tax receipts that's obviously facilitating the sort of budget we saw last week. Um, unfortunately, you know, over and we're, we're seeing it this week, the recovery for the foreseeable future, will be determined by health fundamentals um, and restrictions will remain a fact of life until the vaccine and or medicinal treatment is, um, is it happens. Okay, um, I have to say, and I, I'm sure in the Q&A at the end of this uh, afternoon, um, I am pretty critical of the very, very blanket approach that was taken to the move to level five. I think there was no attempt made to assess different levels of risks in different activities. Um, but the decision has been taken and we'll have to live with it for at least the next six weeks, which I think um, is unfortunate. This is what's happening in the labor market front. You can see out there on the extreme right hand side, you know, we're starting to see the impact of COVID-19 in terms of the labour market. This is a sectoral breakdown of employment changes between the first and the second quarter. Um, and you can see the sectors that are most adversely affected. It's wholesale and retail trade. It's accommodation and food services. Sectors like that, administrative and support services, these sectors that are actually consumer-facing businesses, they are the ones most adversely affected. Um, this is the breakdown of the export performance in the first eight months. And the thing that stands out there is the chemical and pharmaceutical sector. 66% of our total merchandise exports growing very strongly. And as I say, that's providing a very solid anchor for the Irish economy and the public finances. And of course, some of those chemical and pharma companies operate within the um, Sandyford Business District. So it's, it's, it's very, very... That FDI piece is really, really important for the economy at the moment. This is a breakdown of tax revenues in the first nine months. And there's a couple of things I want to say. One is corporation tax receipts growing very strongly, up by almost 28%. The other piece is the fact that income tax has declined by just 2.1%. Given the devastation that's been wreaked on the labor market since March, you would have expected income tax receipts to be significantly weaker. 
but they're holding up remarkably well. And that's because sectors of the economy like foreign direct investment, um, the financial services sector, the public sector, which got a pay increase of 2% on the 1st of October, and professional services, a lot of areas of the economy where the bulk of income tax paid um, are still doing very well in terms of earnings. And of course, that's feeding into what I said a few minutes back about the growth in household deposits. So, um, and, and of course, what that means is that those workers who are most exposed to this crisis are in the accommodation food services sector, in the retail sector, where wages tend to be lower. And because of our very progressive tax system, you know, they pay a lot less income tax. So hence, we, we very much at the moment have this dual economy, large segments of it doing very, very well. And then obviously large segments in significant difficulty that have been compounded by um, what has happened in the last 24 hours with the move to level five. This is household debt. Um, you can see, you know, a pretty remarkable downward trend. Households have been repairing their balance sheet since 2012, 2013. That's good. This is the household deposits bit and that pink line shows you the strong growth in household deposits over the last 12 months. That, as I say, will eventually um, materialize in a strong rebound in pent up demand in the economy, um, which is certainly something um, that we should feel um, welcome about. And this is just some of, the, sorry, these are some of the statistics on that. You can see household finances, um, very healthy, household deposits growing strongly, household debt falling quite sharply. So that does, as I say, set us up for a strong rebound at some stage. Um, so looking at the Irish recovery issues at a national level, okay, um, the economy, you know, started to reopen basically from May onwards, and we saw a significant rebound in economic activity. Um, some sectors obviously didn't share the same sort of rebound because consumer facing businesses were still having to operate in an environment where health protocols were very, very strong and where capacity of businesses was reduced considerably, okay? Um, and of course, then in the last number of weeks, we've seen infection rates rise. We've seen the move back to level five and all of that. So that, that's a problem. Consumers have not lost the spending habit. And I've no doubt that given the opportunity, you know, consumer spending will come back into the system pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the FDI export base is incredibly important to the economy at the moment. FDI employs 245,000 people directly. There's another 200,000 people almost indirectly supported by those jobs. So the FDI thing is really, really good for Ireland at the moment. The agri-food sector doing okay, but it's, it's a challenging environment. Obviously, the biggest challenge it now faces is um, on, the, on the Brexit front, but also... The food services business are under pressure, you know, with restaurants closed, with staff canteens closed. That segment of the agri-food market is gone. So those companies that sell through the retail sector are doing okay. The prospects for international tourism obviously remain very challenging until people are able and willing to fly again. Um, and for the Irish economy, that really, really is a serious hit given that last year we had 10.8 million visitors into the country from overseas, which was a record high. It's clear that COVID-19 support will be required for the foreseeable future for at least the next 18 months. Housing, big issue for government. Health is a big issue for government. They will remain, and, and they, they did feature strongly in the budget last week. And I suppose uh, Brexit, as I've said, still poses a significant threat to um, the Irish economy, but I'm pretty optimistic about that in the sense that I think we will get some sort of deal. Uh, but, you know, whatever way you look at it, and you, can, you can't um, gild the lily here. Um, it's, it's a challenging environment. You know, COVID-19 just represents an absolutely dramatic shock to the economy. And it is going to take some time to return to what we would regard as a more normal level of activity. So I have a level of optimism, but I think we also have to be quite realistic 
These are the economic assumptions underlying the budget last week. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with statistics today, but suffice to say, you know, significant weakness in the domestic economy in 2020, um, a modest rebound expect for 21. And the, key, the two key assumptions underlying that budget was that number one, a vaccine would not be delivered during 2021. And secondly, there would be a hard Brexit. You know, hopefully, both of those will prove wrong and that the economic rebound will be stronger. But the caveat there, of course, is that um, in the final quarter of this year, activity is obviously going to be constrained by the fact that we've moved back into level five. Um, so the priority in the budget was obviously to support those businesses, those households most affected by um, COVID-19. And of course, there was also a significant priority given to uh, the challenges posed by Brexit. And the other three areas that dominated the budget last week, and this reflects the formation of the government we saw back in July, health, housing, climate change, are the three big national issues at this juncture. If you ignore COVID-19 and Brexit, that's where um, we're going to be devoting most official attention for the foreseeable future, as in years to come. And we saw last week, you know, a significant government investment in um, social and affordable housing, particularly. So, um, a, an incredible budget in a sense that, you know, a massive expenditure package, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, we got a 17.4 billion increase in expenditure and just 270 million in next net tax changes. Um, and, and that reflects, sorry, that was the, the VAT rate cut for the hospitality sector from 13.5% to 9% was the main thing that was done on the tax side. Uh, the capital budget, 10.1 billion, which is the highest capital budget ever um, introduced in this country. And I think that is wholly and totally appropriate because we do need to invest in physical infrastructure capital spending. I think that's really important for the longer term of the economy. Um, and I suppose the other bit of the budget that stands out was obviously uh, the funding that was directed towards um, dealing with COVID-19 and with Brexit. And a lot of it, that spending is conditional on what happens in both of those areas during 2021. Um, I, so I, I think broadly speaking, you know, the budget was totally appropriate for an economy facing the challenges that Ireland is facing at the moment. Two sectors, um, I think, could justifiably feel aggrieved after the budget. One is the motor industry um, with the changes in VRT rates for climate reasons. Um, you know, those price increases for many cars will come at a time that, you know, the motor industry has come through five very, very difficult years. So the last thing in the world that sector required at this stage um, was an increase in the price of any vehicles. Um, so, but but clearly that's the future. You know, that is the environmental agenda. And then there was nothing in there for the airline industry. Um, but for most other sectors, certainly um, it was um, a decent budget. Now, looking at the, the future nationally, and I suppose for the Sandyford Business District, um, COVID-19 will is and will continue to, you know, have fundamental implications for um, the Irish economy and indeed for the whole Sandyford business district. Okay, there's, there's a lot of different ways it's impacting. Obviously, many of the businesses in that district have been very adversely affected by what has happened since March. Other businesses within the district um, have, you know, continued to perform very, very strongly. And I just reiterate the point I made earlier in my presentation that this dual nature of the economy, you know, is is, is incredibly obvious at this stage. And, and, you know, economically, and I think socially, we are seeing massive um, increases in inequality again. And I think that's going to be a big issue that the government is going to have to deal with in the aftermath of this. But, but also, um, this is a global issue. It's, it's not unique to Ireland. Remote working has become obviously 
a feature of the environment. Um, does this mean that the office is dead? No, it's not. I mean, I think once we come out of this, the working environment will be different. Some people will want to work from home. Others will want to work in the office and others will like a hybrid model. So I think there's going to be a much greater element of flexibility built into the system. Okay, but definitely a lot of business have discovered actually that remote working does work and, and it is for employers. Um, I think they are going to have to build in that level of flexibility for workers where appropriate, obviously, because there are some businesses where remote working simply doesn't work. But I think there's going to be have to be a much more flexible approach to that. What does it mean for office space? Does it mean we're going to see thousands of vacant office spaces around uh, the city? Um, I, I actually don't think so. I still think the demand for office space, you know, at the end of all of this will be strong, but something we need to keep an eye on uh, working from home. And I also think that enterprise hubs, you know, of uh, of the variety we have in Dunleary, for example, these could become, I think, an incredibly important part of the future economic model. Of course, technology is the crucial enabler of all of this, you know, and hence at a company level, at a national level, investment in technology, investment in technological capability, investment in broadband, et cetera, you know, has to be a local and a national priority because it is going to become an increasingly important driver of the future. Um, bricks and mortar retail, obviously under significant pressure, and those pressures have been exacerbated by the move to level five. Uh, it's definitely a challenging future. You know, we're seeing a remarkable move to online. And you could certainly say that this whole long-term trend that's been evident in the retail sector for the last 10 years, at least, um, the move towards remote shopping um, probably got pushed forward five years in the space of six months since March. So s huge challenges there for the retail sector to respond to this. Um, and, you know, for uh, the Sandyford Business District, you know, I think that's a significant issue. The hospitality sector, likewise, you know, lots of hospitality businesses in serious trouble. They're getting a lot of support, but many will quite simply disappear. So I hope not, but that's the reality. You would hope that you will see new businesses starting to take their place. And I think for the local authority, um, the local authority will be a key enabler of this process of creative destruction. And I suppose the other point about nationally and for the Sandyford Business uh, District, you know, the environmental agenda is, is going to be absolutely crucial for the foreseeable future, I think is going to, more than anything else, drive the development of the area um, and, and as it should, as far forward as we can realistically see. You know, it's, it's up there as probably top of the longer term agenda once we get through things like COVID-19 and Brexit, which I hope we will um, pretty quickly. So, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, skip through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Thank you for your attention. And um, I will be back in the panel session later on. So if you have any queries, questions, or fundamental disagreements with what I've been saying, um, I'd be delighted to handle that later on. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Uh, thank you, Jim Power. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to feel after your presentation, but I'm still upbeat. I still remain positive and I'm delighted uh, that you're predicting modest growth in uh, 2021. I know there's some caveats, but uh, you know there is light at the end of the tunnel. But um, you're going to remain with us, uh, Jim, and we, we'll, uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end of uh, this afternoon's session. Just a reminder to everybody that you can um, submit questions on slido.com and also um, send them in by email to events at sandyford.ie. Uh, next up, uh, we have Owen Laverty. Uh, Owen is Head of Econo Enterprise Economics at Dunleary Down County Council. Uh, Owen has significant experience at senior level in corporate, startup, uh, university, and public sector environments. Uh, Owen currently leads a team that provides support to the startup, enterprise, and economic development activities in Dunleary Down. 
as an engineer with over 25 years experience in uh, product development, working for Philips uh, Electronics, uh, Magna, Magna Donnelly Design Partners. He previously ran his own technology company specializing in bringing products to the marketplace. Owen Laverty, you're very welcome. You're going to talk to us about uh, digital trading online vouchers and DLO or Lean. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, Connor. Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk today and be part of this great lineup for Innovation Week. Um, I know I was, uh, I, I, I expanded the, the remit of my talk a little bit um, beyond Tavs because I just thought in this uh, time, we're seeing an awful lot of businesses pivot, talking an awful lot about change. I think it's a, it's a subject that I've just expanded the talk into a little bit. So, um, so the new title is uh, How to uh, Innovate in a Rapidly Expanding uh, Landscape. And I think there's a quote that always strikes me and always comes to mind when you're talking about innovation. It's the, it's the pace of change has never been this fast, yet it'll never be this slow again. And um, that was um, from Trudeau and Davos in 2018. And we're all seeing massive acceleration, particularly as Jim was referring to for retail uh, shopping habits, um, an awful lot of uh, retail has gone online, but there's enough, there's, there's innovation all around. Um, and just to, I'm trying to click here, sorry, I'm not getting my clicker working here for some reason. Okay, there we go. The other, uh, another quote, and this is my last quote uh, of the afternoon, um, it's uh, Jack Welch, the former CEO of General Electric, who were the darlings of the stock market. For, for a very long time um, in the US, and they, they've always been at the forefront of innovation. And I, I just like this quote saying that if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is in sight. Now, bearing in mind, General Electric always strove to be at the forefront of, of, of innovation. Um, you don't have to particularly be at the forefront, but I think you do have to be close to it. So, if you ask yourself the question, when is the last time you purposefully innovated to deliver value to the end user? Because and the end user piece in this quote is, is extremely important because you should look at whatever innovation you're looking to do. If it doesn't have an impact in the end to the end user in some way, shape or form, um, you do have to question it. Um, the other bit to, for consideration is when is the last time your competition purposely innovated. So, you know, you need to be aware of what's happening around you, um, what your competition are, are up to, because, you know, everyone is trying to compete in, in, in a small pool. There's limited resources in, in any market, particularly if you're in a niche market. So you do need to have your heads up and uh, see what's going on around you. And then also, have you spotted an opportunity in the market or your organization, but you don't know how to innovate to seize that opportunity. And that's very real in many organizations. Um, maybe the culture isn't right, the opportunities aren't right to actually get your voice heard, or there isn't a system in place to allow that innovation to be considered or enabled. So in terms of innovation readiness, um, companies, different companies have different stages of innovation readiness, and they can be cultural, um, knowledge of IP, the IP landscape. Um, have you financial knowledge around innovation? Do you know about the tax breaks? Um, do you know about the knowledge box? Do you know about supports? So what kind of supports are out there? And I'll be talking a good bit about that later on. Um, and what's your domain knowledge in the space? And also what's the skill set in terms of technical development and uh, marketing development or sales development, whatever area you're looking to innovate in? So a lot of people get confused and about innovation, and I've been in the innovation space for probably 30 years now, and, and it means different things to different people, and, and that's fine. Um, you know, I'll I just give you a couple of examples. Um, a good example of what I call deliberate innovation is uh, there's a 15-year-old called uh, Jack and Draca. And I met Jack at, at a Wired uh, conference in London. I, I, I used to travel quite a bit to, to conferences to try and understand the latest in technology and, and trends and thinking. And I think it's really important um, because 
you know, I'd have a lot of clients who would be who would, who would be advising and we'd see quite a lot of um, uh, requests for support. So we need to feed back in to those clients what's actually happening on the ground or even to be able to assess whether or not um, they they are they're they're up to speed in their in their in their space. But Jack uh, saw a problem. Um, a good neighbour, a uh, good friend died uh, of pancreatic cancer, and Jack, being a, a, a young young fifteen year old, figured well, you know, he, he couldn't understand why this had happened when he'd heard that the cure, well, that you can only um, get tested for pan- you only get tested for pancreatic cancer once you're symptomatic, and when you're symptomatic. It's probably too late. So, and the reason people don't get tested on a routine basis, and even if they're in a high risk category, is because the test is very expensive. Um, so Jack went about um, using his summer break uh, to basically have vials of chemicals and biological samples and etc. in his kitchen. Uh, he moved on to working in a university lab after pleading with uh, with a, a local uh, professor. And he ended up inventing a, a system for developing a very, very uh, low-cost test for um, for for testing um, the whether or not pancreatic cancer was a, was a health challenge for somebody. So that's someone who's very deliberate. They went out, they saw a problem, and they went out to find it. But the interesting thing about this, and this is the innovation space that we're in at the moment, this is one of the opportunities that innovators have, is Jack, obviously at 15, had no formal uh, training in the, in the biological sciences, in, in the health sciences. So the, the common moniker that's been used uh, for describing Jack's success is that, you know, he invented uh, a cure using Google. Um, so we are in the golden age uh, for innovators. Uh, information has been heavily democratized. Um, and the next invention is something that I worked at this company when I was in uh, Maynooth University. Um, uh, an amazing professor called Brian Roach um, had a theory that the way we relate things in our brain to each other um, is a is a measure, and our ability to do that is a measure of, of our IQ. Um, it was an inspired um, kind of bit of bit of bit of work, um, and Brian spent the next five years proving that this was so. And obviously, you know, he, the, the system, he, he coined the term uh, relational frame training for this system. And it was incredibly disruptive. Um, it was in the university at the time, I think there was some, some eyebrows raised when he was making a claim that um, the system could potentially increase someone's IQ by 30 points, which is, which is massive. Um, so, and he definitely went against the tide um, in his in his uh, efforts. But he's now got this company called Razor IQ, which is um, which is quite successful. They've had quite a lot of pivots, and uh, I would recommend anybody to to give it a go. The next one is iterative and organizational innovation, and um, I would ask um, if people are in an organization where they feel okay, well, I can't actually do any huge, you know, there's no product. Uh, innovation that we can do or system innovation, there's always some sort of innovation you can do. And I think the lean thinking is is something that we're actually really pushing in DLR. Um, and we've got a website called leandlr.ie where you see these six contributors talking about their, their lean journeys and the impact it's made. The testimonials around how it's basically allowed them to survive and thrive and I just highlighted uh, one, one person there, um, Gavin Carpenter, CEO of Phonovation. And, and Gavin would, um, he has basically, um, they've made a sport out of finding uh, improvements in their business. So Gavin is uh, one of the, what is an ambassador for Lean. And if you go on to Lean DLR and, and just, just hear what he has to say about it, but we have seen companies, uh, there's a Lean for Micro program that, that we run to the local enterprise office, and it's a broader Lean uh, program that we're going to be running um, under the Lean uh, DLR.ie um, uh, look, uh, the, the website. And in some of those companies have seen productivity up by 20%, sales up by 40%, delivery adherence up by 43 and just generally improving their delivery and their outcome and having happier clients. 
Then, of course, there's a cultural piece. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because Joanne's going to talk about it. Uh, Joanne Hessian, CEO of Lift Ireland. But needless to say, if the culture isn't right in your organisation to facilitate innovation, um, you're really going to have a problem um, basically getting that innovation um, through your organisation. I think what Lyft does is uh, creates a space and allows people to the right people to be at the table and allows inclusion. And that's been proven to be hugely beneficial and hugely important um, for, uh, for successful innovation in an organization. But then when we talk, I mean, so that's there the kind of the, the my, my, my kind of my attempts to um, pigeonhole innovation and try and kind of categorize it. But of course, in sport, um, it's innovation is everything. When you're chasing that 1%, we see sports now, um, those, those tiny level of improvements are necessary to win, especially at the highest level. And just to give you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big sailing fan and uh, an example, I guess, of, of uh, innovation, the America's Cup um, is a highly technical um, event um, with all the latest innovations in, in boats and uh, and this next year we'll see boats uh, going at 50 knots, which is which is faster than the wind, which is just incredible. But a big innovation, a, a way, an innovative way of thinking, um, why New Zealand won the cup last time round is they replaced the, the pedestal the, on the right hand side in the, in the big picture. You'll see this what is called a coffee grinder, where guys are using their arms to to power the boat up, power all the systems in the boat, and keep everything going. It's when you collapse, when you use your arms, you're collapsing your lungs and you're reducing your, your, your capacity to, uh, to take in oxygen. And so it's, it's more tiring and it's harder to have a sustained effort. And um, the, the Kiwis very imaginatively decided to use bikes. And they put uh, four or five guys on bikes. They're much uh, able to produce more power for longer and more sustained effort. And interesting enough, they're actually able to, their, their, their position allows them to be more aerodynamic. And then of course the IRFU, we you know Ireland invented the, the rugby the choke tackle, which served us very well for a long time. Um, Dublin football team, I mean they've been incredible in the way they've innovated, and not just in the way they've they 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 plan their game. I, I think when you hear the, the team players speak, the organisational innovation that's taken place becomes very apparent if you if you know what to look for. So these companies have uh, these teams have been proven that innovation has been key to, to winning, especially in, in sport, where, the, where the, 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 you know, the, the, the margins are so small. Um, and, you know, indeed, there's a company called Kitman Labs in Ireland um, and many companies like that who are just continuously measuring output for teams. So that's a lesson for companies to be continuously innovating, continuously reflecting. And it's not something that you just do once and forget about. It's something that you have to have. It has to be a habit. So it is a great time to innovate. Uh, the cost of design and manufacturing has come down rapidly. Um, it allows you to discover and, and to fail cheaply and quickly. And companies are actively looking for opportunities. So if you are an innovator, companies are looking. Big corporates know that they don't have the best, always have the best minds. And the best ideas and they're always looking to get cozy and get close to smaller startups and um, especially when they're disruptive and th there are opportunities to, to get to get bought by those bigger companies and then of course going back to jack and drack that piece you know information has been democratized and and so there's never it's never been easier to get information and of course there is significant state support but don't forget selling um, selling has got um, it's evolved, um, like everything else. You can, you can see from the graph there, year on year, Dublin selling online is up 43% in Dublin, it's up 41% in Ireland. Um, so selling now is increasingly complicated. So do you need to have to figure out how you're actually going to innovate how you sell? Are you using data, right? Do you understand the algorithms? Do you understand Google uh, properly? If you are interested in getting online, we have a trading online voucher, and you can go to the local enterprise office in Dunleary or anywhere anywhere you you happen your business happens to be located, and uh, get access to that look, that trading online voucher. So that is a, at the moment it's a ninety percent uh, funded um, program of up to two and a half thousand euros in spend, 
that may change, um, but it, at the moment it is 90%. I just want to talk about trends because when, especially if you're in the technology space, but nowadays even in any space, you're looking at everything that's going on, you know, in plant foods, digital health, um, supercomputing, AI, driverless cars, robotic manufacturing. You know, on the left-hand side of that, that image, we have a shoe, a, a printed shoe, 3D printed shoe. We have meat that's going to be grown probably more economically in a lab, in a factory than, than farms that will come to the market in 10 years' time. We have printed houses. So it's really, it's really hard to, um, to understand how you're going to get involved in these spaces. Um, but I think understanding how to react is key for survival. And we are in what's called the fourth industrial revolution, where we have increased automation and functionality across the board. So the key to surviving this is, you know, awareness of the disruptive technology and a plan to develop talent that can make the most of it. So don't be a passive observer. Um, be, be a leader and, um, you know, be, be, get involved. Join special interest groups. So AI Dublin, for instance, if you're in the artificial intelligence space, and you get educated, network and partner with, with people who are in the space who know more than you do and tap into the resources and the local uh, knowledge base. And you can also um, come to us um, and look for a feasibility study to help fund those uh, studies that are close to market. Um, in terms of state support, there's a massive amount of state support in Ireland, and we're very, very lucky. On your doorstep, you have no BCD, IDT, ourselves, you have EI, New Frontiers, and I know Owen Hanron's going to talk a little about the EI ones. But if you're a business that wants to innovate, and you need particular, you need advice in particular high tech sector, or you have a project that you want to help, that you want help with in the high tech sector, there is a, a vast array of enterprise centres of excellence. Um, you can see here there's EI centres of excellence, and they all specialise in various different elements of technology, and they have up to date knowledge in this space, and their 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 role is to support Irish industry. And there are ways you can tap into those, and I'll talk about those in a second. And then at Science Foundation Ireland has 17 of these centres, um, which you can go to for advice and help. So if you are like a company that's wondering, God, you know, I'm so far away from where I need to be. How do I even, you know, how do I tap into this knowledge base? These are great assets and they're national assets. And there's a great tool if you go to KTI. .ie, that's knowledge transfer Ireland .ie. and if you go to the on the first on the first page if you on the landing page if you just scroll down a bit you'll see a uh, button there saying for try the or &I, uh, funding tool and that will guide you through the various funding supports that are available and I highly recognize uh, recommend that you look at that so how do you ensure longevity in this accelerated world I think you have to work closely with the future makers to have a chance of being a leader. Make sure you partner and innovate. Plan to be disrupted, but know your options if you are going to be disrupted. Develop flexibility in your organization to allow quick pivots. And Lean is a great tool for allowing you to do that. When I was talking to Gavin Carpenter, uh, uh, CEO of Phonovation, who's the, the, lead, the Lean ambassador, they were able to uh, work remotely within six hours. And know where to look for government support. You can come to us at localenterprise.ie forward slash DLR for information on the trading online vouchers and, and the feasibility study grants and Agile as well, but I know Owen's gonna talk about that, um, but our doors are always open. So I guess wanting to change and doing so are two very different things. And an outside perspective, is often necessary to break the deadlock. So with that in mind, um, the LEOs have come together and developed a program called the Breakthrough Innovation Program, and it'll help companies. So I'll just go back there for a second. There's the breakthroughinnovations.ie at the bottom of the page there, um, and that will help you get started in your innovation journey. And a quick overview of the content of that is here. So it allows you to, to, to evaluate all the way through to implement. 
your your innovation uh, requirements, your innovation uh, needs. So that's a whistle stop tour of um, a re of of, uh, and I hope that what it will do is give people a bit of context, and give them a bit of direction. Um, if they are wondering, you know, how to be at the cutting edge and how to take part in what is a, a very fast and a soon to be even faster environment. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I look forward to the panel later on. Owen Laverty, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Joanne Hessian, uh, founder Lift Ireland. Uh, Joanne is Executive Director of the Entrepreneurs Academy, which has trained over 30,000 people towards success. Joanne is passionate and efficient and effective in helping individuals and organizations achieve their potential through leadership training. In 2018, Joanne stepped away from her business to found Lift Ireland, a national leadership initiative that builds authentic leadership across the country at the kitchen table, in the classroom, clubhouse, and boardroom. Uh, you're just missing the uh, back garden, Joanne, um, but you're very welcome, and we look forward to hearing from, uh, from you about leading Ireland's future together. Uh, Joanne is also <laughs> experiencing connectivity issues, uh, but we're, we're working with Joanne at the moment uh, to try and uh, bring her back. Uh, hopefully we'll have her back uh, very quickly. Uh, just a reminder about today's, uh, this afternoon's uh, session. It's about economic forecasting and agile innovation. Uh, we, we've heard from Jim Power, uh, lecturer Michael Smurfett, uh, Graduate School of uh, Economics UCD, and also Owen Laverty, Head of Enterprise Economics, Stanley Rattan County Council. Uh, I suppose the good news coming from Jim Power is that we're going to see uh, modest economic growth in 2021 and we will be speaking uh, to Jim at the end of this session whenever that uh, may be and we'll also be speaking to uh, Owen Laverty about um, uh, the supports that the uh, local enterprise office provide and also uh, about breakthrough innovation. I was speaking earlier just uh, before I got uh, uh, cut off and brought the, the, the last speaker on, uh, just in relation to the online sales at 29 uh, million euro. I think we're, I think we're okay now, yes. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome back uh, Joanne Hessian from Lift Ireland. And Joanne, you're going to speak to us about leading Ireland's future together. I am, Connor. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be part of this great session that you have here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Lyft and I'm going to talk to you about leadership. Um, and you might think well, leadership is sort of a bit warm and fluffy uh, and a bit fuzzy, but bear with me because I've got a lot of good news about how we need to be paying attention to this and more importantly, why we need to be paying attention to this. So the first thing is, is that let me ask three questions. First question is, is who here is a leader? Because I need to get us all on the same page about this. The second question is, well, what makes a really good leader? And the third question is, well, what difference does it make anyway? Because we, we you know, we, like why bother with leadership? You know, that's a really important bit. Just to let the, the guys know that are that are organizing this, the clicker isn't moving forward for me on that. Um, Perfect. Thanks a million. So the three questions, who's a, here is a leader? What makes a great leader? And why bother, bother with leadership anyway? Why pay any attention to it when there is so much else to do? We're very busy at the moment. Our businesses are busy and so on. And we are in very uncertain times. So the first question, who here is a leader? Now, before you start putting into the chat room or the question function and start putting up your hands or saying, well, Owen definitely is and the other Owen and Jim and everybody, Connor and everybody involved and Leanne and Val and everybody in the background, who here is a leader? Before you start doing that, let me tell you that I'm going to answer the question because every single person in this room is a leader whether you are the positional leader head of your organization, whether you are somebody who is just one or two weeks in the door of your organization, it doesn't matter. 
Every single person is a leader. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that if you've got people around you that are paying attention to what you're saying, if you've got colleagues, if you've got teammates, if you've got people in your workplace, people on online, on Zoom, or uh, that, that you're meeting at home, if you've got people that are paying attention to what you're saying, then you are leading them. And sometimes you're leading them well, and sometimes you're leading them not so well. And sometimes they're leading you, and sometimes you're leading them. So leadership, very much, there's an ebb and flow to leadership. But every single person in this virtual room is a leader, every single person. And the better we lead, the more positive influence and the more positive results and hard, tangible results we can get around us. And the second question then that I asked is, well, what makes a great leader. And someone once said to me that, well, you don't follow positions and titles. Joanne, you follow character. Character makes a great leader. A position or a title, so my position or title and somebody else's position or title, that might buy me a little bit of time with people. They might pay attention and follow me a little bit because of my position or title but not for long because it's who I am. It's my character that makes me a great leader. So if I'm listening and making sure that every single person that I meet makes, I make them feel like they're worth a hundred percent of my attention, even if it's only for a few minutes, then I'm leading well. That's a good character area. Or if I hold respect For every single individual, not just for those that I might agree with, not just for those with those that think the way that I do, or perhaps I find similar to myself. But if I hold respect for every single person, if I make sure that every single person knows that they have value and feels that they have value, then I am showing good leadership. And there are all kinds of other areas that are really important to make us great leaders. Look at these areas here. So we did research in 2018 and we asked the people of Ireland, if we're to become better leaders, in what areas do we need to actually build our leadership muscle? And Ireland said, well, we need more respect. We need more honesty and integrity. We need more confidence, more dedication and determination and grit. We need more listening and better listening. We need more positive attitude. And we all know we need a lot of that at the moment. Jim, I think you did a great job with that earlier. It's not about being happy, clappy about this stuff. It's about realizing that this is where we are now, but it's about taking a positive rather than a negative attitude about it. It's about accountability. It's about me being able to hold myself accountable, but also being able to hold other people accountable in a way that doesn't crush them, but instead does it with respect and with kindness. It's about empathy and understanding. And do you know what? Look, I'm a business graduate from a long time ago. I did accountancy. If you'd asked me years ago, uh, would I be you know, doing some of this, what might be deemed to be softer stuff years ago, I was, I'd have said, you've got to be joking. But actually, this stuff is the hard stuff. This is the really important stuff that often gets ignored. It's what builds our cultures in our organization, and it is extremely important. So um, moving on to what makes a, uh, not, not makes a great leader, but why bother with leadership? We need to bother with it because this is so important. Culture is important. We had physical culture before. Now we've got online culture and organizations are wondering, how do we build this connectivity? How do we build our culture now that we're online? This is really important. And it's important because if we pay attention to leadership, if I pay attention to how I lead, and if I look at upping my levels of how how much respect I have and my honesty and my integrity and all these other areas, because I guarantee I can get better and 
so can everybody else as well. We can all up in these areas. More of this means a better uh, society, but it also means better around our circle of influence. Everything gets better. Now, in addition to the eight areas that Ireland identified two years ago, we've also added in two more areas that are very important in how we lead at the moment. One is resilience and the other is innovation and adaptability. And sometimes when we think of innovation and adaptability, we think of seismic change. But actually, this is about small innovation. This is about small adapting. This is about my gym closed this morning and I now have no gym to go to. What small adaptations can be made so that I can still keep doing the exercise that I need to do over the next few weeks? That's what this is all about. Now, leadership is important because more of this means more listening. Now, if more listening may be listening to that colleague that really needs to be heard at the moment, more of this means more respect. Now, if we think about this, imagine if every person in our country not only knew that they had value, but felt that they had value. Every single person in our country, imagine if every single person felt that they had value. That's what good leadership does. That's what me lifting my leadership in my circle of influence and you doing the same does as well. This is, this is why leadership is important. But for me, who did accountancy all those years ago and has moved into this whole area of, of leadership and thought, well, actually, it's the P&L, it's the, it's the money side, that's what's really important. The good news is, is that this is not Pollyanna stuff. This is good for society, but it's also good for business. Good leadership and good character is good for business. Fred Keel did research that he spent from 2007 to 2014 doing. It was published by Harvard in... Uh, 2015, where it shows that a study of 120 CEOs, that the five leaders with the highest character score, those leaders who had the highest character score got the highest return on assets in their businesses. Really interesting as well, that those leaders, they rated themselves, but their people also rated them in a huge range of character areas. Now, when they rated themselves, they actually rated themselves lower than everybody else had rated them. Interestingly, the guys that are guys and females and males that got the median character score and the lowest character score, they had rated themselves higher then other people had rated them, which is kind of interesting too. But this is important. Leadership is very important. Sometimes we push it aside and say it's not important, but it will give us better return in our business. And also it will help us with our cultures. Every single person in our business is a leader. We want every single person to be leading themselves well and to be leading around them well. And that's where Lift Ireland comes in. Because LIFT Ireland, LIFT stands for Leading Ireland's Future Together. LIFT is an initiative that is aimed at increasing the level of positive leadership in Ireland. We are run by, we're a not-for-profit organization and we're on a 10-year goal to get 10% of the population building its leadership. We're supported and partnered by Dunleary Rathdown County Council, and Owen is a keen lifter there, as indeed are Phonovation uh, uh, in the in the district too. And Sandyford Business District is one of our partner organisations, and we are looking at lifting the businesses within the district, raising the level of leadership. This is no criticism of any positional leader. That's not what this is. This is about building our inner leadership muscle. That's what we are all about. So we're on a 10-year journey to get 10% of the population lifting its leadership. And we have it happening in all corners of the country, in all different kind of areas, all different kind of organizations. Lift won the Champion Leadership Program 2020 this year for the, being a leadership program within one of our partner organizations. Another, you know, the finalists in the HR Champion Awards were AIB, the HSC, and the Prem Group. The Prem Group had only done lift within their organization and they won the HR Champion Award this year. It is really, really effective, the lift program. It's not like any other training program. It's a process that we show you how to use. 
These are some of the organizations that are currently partnered with Lyft. Now, in addition to these organizations, we have Phonovation in Dunleary Rathdown in the in this district. We have Covalen in this district, one of uh, CPL's biggest uh, divisions. We have Enterprise Solutions, a small business in the area, all using Lyft to build their leadership within their people. We also, as an organization, uh, help other organizations that can't normally afford any kind of leadership uh, training or anything like that. So we have what we call a Robin Hood model, where organizations that can afford to take part with us give us a financial contribution. And those organizations that can't they are still welcome and can still take part. So any organization can take part in Lyft, whether you're a, a residential center like New Hope that deals with addicts um, and doesn't have the funding or any organization, any organization can take part. Lyft is also working with the schools around the country. We've over 4,000 transition year students that are building their leadership muscle, looking at how to become more resilient, how to have a more positive attitude, how to build their listening skills. These are all so vital for our young people and for us at the moment. So we have in our first year, we took one pilot school. It was Comfy College in Leesip. Last year, we took 28 schools. And this year, we're taking 100 secondary schools and getting their transition years to build their leadership. We've also partnered with some of the universities. That means that we're building leadership when they're 16 and we're building it again when they hit 19 or 20. And then when they come into our organizations, they will be building it again. They will have a really good understanding of what good leadership is. It's about who we are on the inside and it's really vitally important for our country. This is the impact of Lyft. A few little stats on it. Impact is really important. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business person. Set up my own business when I was 27. I have two businesses. They're working well. I stood out of those to really push Lyft and drive Lyft and have a team that run those businesses. And, you know, I'm not doing it just for the fun of it. It's really important that we get impact. So how do we know that Lyft is actually working? So there's 100% of people that feel say that Lyft is an important way or an effective way to look at these areas. But the figure I'm really interested in is that figure that's over 80% there. And to be honest, if it was over 40% or 30%, I'd be really happy with that. 89% of people that are using the Lyft process are saying that they can, they can attribute positive behavior change because of going through the Lyft process. It is a muscle building, a character building, leadership character building process. And over 80% of people going through it are give citing examples of where their behavior is changing. And that is what we are really interested in because this stuff that is often seen as the soft stuff, and I said earlier, is the hard stuff. It is the hard stuff. It is hard to get behavior change happening. So it's fantastic that we're starting to see these results at such an early stage as we're only into just into the start of year three with what we're doing. So you might push me on a slide there, um, Val, if you're there. Ah, super. So Sandyford Business District is the first district in the country, the first business district to partner with, partner with Lyft because they see how important it is for us to strengthen our cultures, for us to enhance our cultures, for us to do everything that we can to make sure that we build trust, that we make sure we're wholly inclusive, that we build engagement, that we build connectivity in our businesses. This is really important. And Lyft is a process to help with that. It is it is about realizing that it's not just about where we work. It's not just about the physical in infrastructure. It's not just about the Lewis line, but it's about the environment that we create in our businesses and Lyft can really help it. Now, the good news is, especially for all of us that are business owners um, and, and in business, it's efficient. It's really easy. It's efficient. It takes 45 minutes a week. There's no prep. It's not like a learning program that you have to go in and study it afterwards. It's not like that at all. It's focused, it's reflective, 
it's timely and it's time bound. So it's a bit like going to a gym session for building your leadership muscle. It is challenging. It can be done online or it can be done face to face. It's based on extremely good research and it has integrity at its core. And I would highly encourage you all to get involved in it. And the good news is, is that Sandford Business District would like to invite 25 companies to be gifted free training by the Sandyford Business District to become ambassadors of Lyft in, in Sandyford. So we will train 25 companies. We will train somebody from each of the 25 companies to bring Lyft into your organization. And if you're interested in being one of those 25 that would like to lift your organization and be part of Lifting Ireland, then please email kim at liftireland.ie. My name is Joanne. Uh, so I'm joanne at liftireland.ie if you've any questions at all. But if you'd like to become one of these 25 companies, please email kim at liftireland.ie. This is extremely important. It's a fantastic opportunity for businesses in the district. And thank you so much for enabling me to come along and talk about it today. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. Um, yeah, Lyft, I, um, I've, I have a brief understanding and knowledge about Lyft, and I'd strongly recommend uh, businesses within Sandy for Business District and also outside Sandy for Business District to get in touch. Um, we're going to be rejoined now by uh, Owen Laverty and Jim Power. I'm also joined uh, by Lorraine Higgins, and Lorraine is going to uh, assist and help out with the, uh, the moderation today. Um, and um, over to Lorraine now. I think you want to pose uh, some questions to, uh, to Jim. I think Jim is first up. Hi, Jim. Um, just one question for you, given that your sphere is uh, the economy and you're an expert in this area. We know from a recent central bank report that there are record numbers of euros on reserve and on deposit in many household bank accounts throughout Ireland. I think they put the figure at 120 billion. But we also know that the recent spend and save scheme that was introduced by the government to try and stimulate spending in the hospitality and restaurant sector isn't really going to work now, given that we've just started our second lockdown. So I guess the question to you is, what can the government do now to try and stimulate and encourage people to spend money at the moment? Um, I think we, we just have Joanne at the moment. We're just uh, uh, struggling with connectivity uh, with Jim. So Joanne, if, uh, if you can hear me, I'll just pose a, a question or an observation to you. Uh, you started off uh, your presentation saying that, you know, everyone is a leader. Um, is that the case? You know, we all have different personality traits. We're all different people. But really and genuinely, can anybody be a leader? And if so, can you just expand on that a little? Yeah, absolutely, Connor. So if you think about it, Connor, if you've got people at home paying attention to what you're saying, you're leading them. Now, sometimes they're leading you as well. Every single person is leading because leadership at its real core, at its essence, is about influence. And if I'm influencing you in a positive way, because we're only talking about positive leadership here, then uh, if I'm influencing you, then I'm leading you. Now, that means also that my three teenagers at home are leaders and sometimes they're leading me. But I need to make sure that I'm leading them more than they're leading me. And this is about us all building our positive influence because I could be in a position of leadership, a title. I could have a title of a leader. I could be president of this country at the moment and have that title. I may not be leading very well, though, and I may not have a lot of positive influence. And that is no, no character assassination at all of our president because he's amazing. But I suppose the point I'm making is, is that the position and title does not make the leader. It's how we behave. It's uh, it, and and the 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 character of the leader is what makes us want to follow the leader. So I want to follow somebody that has great integrity, and I want to follow somebody that has huge respect for uh for for humankind, and I want to follow somebody that has empathy and understanding, and I want to follow somebody that is you know, that shows accountability both for themselves, but also of other people in a really respectful way. 
So all these attributes are hugely important. And what we all need to realize is that our 14-year-olds are leaders. And, and we need to help them build their leadership. But also our 40-year-olds and our 50-year-olds and our 60-year-olds are also leaders. And it's not about us getting older all the time. It's about us getting older and getting better. Every time we hit a birthday, we get older. Doesn't mean we get better. We have to work at this stuff. So this is about getting better as a leader so that we increase the positive influence and we increase the positive leadership around us. Is Jim coming back? Thank you, Joanne. Uh, it's good to hear. Um, so there's, there's hope for myself anyway. A uh, couple of things I need to work on, but uh, no, it's good to hear. Um, Owen Laverty, you're back with us. That's great. Um, Owen, you were speaking about uh, breakthrough innovation just very briefly. Can you give us more detail around that? It sounds fascinating. Absolutely, um, and thanks very much. So it's a it's a it's a program that was, it's only really being kicked off in the last quarter, and um, it's an eleven point framework that allows people to discover where the potential lies in their organisation and help set businesses get to the next level. Um, so there's nine it's nine uh, online sessions and uh, and, and offline sessions over four weeks. So there's, there's, it starts with like introductions, innovation challenges, and all the way down to breakthrough innovation plays and talks about innovation process and the cost model, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, and this is, uh, I think you have to have this in, in, in any innovation um, conversation, it's the value proposition and, and figuring out what the value proposition is. So it's a program that invites senior management, so the CEOs, CTOs, CFOs, heads of sales, etc., um, and to, to to participate. And there's only five companies um, on the program at any one intake, and the next intake is in November. So it's amazing value for money, and we're very, I think, you know, in the in the support uh, infrastructure that we have at the moment, we're all very conscious. So the sun's coming in there now. We're all very conscious of um, of. of of the, the struggles that companies are having. So it's only 50 euros for 25 hours of time. Um, so ultimately, it, it's, it's about getting people started on that, on that innovation journey. Uh, thank you, Owen. Um, we now have Jim Power back, which is great. Uh, Jim, we have a number of questions for you, and uh, I'll just pass you over to Lorraine. Hi, Jim. I guess everybody's Hi, really interested in the economy right at the moment. And who better than yourself to give us a, a, an outlook as to where things are going and, and where we're at. But I had asked earlier about, you know, household spend is at a record level with uh, reportedly 120 billion euro in savings. Um, the government have tried to introduce a stimulus plan in terms of the stay and spend scheme, but we know now with the second lockdown, it's not going to be possible to optimize that. So what would you see as being an effective policy for stimulating uh, spending at this moment in time? Okay, Lorraine, um, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, Jim. Okay, sorry, yeah, okay. Um, well, obviously the stay and spend scheme, which has to be spent in a restaurant, um, in, in a meal that's taken in the restaurant, um, that's a problem if the restaurant is closed, obviously. Um, secondly, the cut in the VAT rate from 13.5% to 9% only applies if a business is open. So that there are th those stimulus measures will have absolutely no impact so I, I think they need to revisit. Um, there is a suggestion, for example, that takeaway um, should now be included in the stay and spend. That's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility, we wait until early December when hopefully all those businesses will reopen and then suddenly you, you will get a, a massive catch up happening. Um, the other possibility I think would be Looking at, um, you know, that there, there is a scheme at the moment whereby an employer can give an employee up to a voucher for 500 euro. And typically it's a one for all voucher. OK, it's a way of rewarding staff in a tax efficient manner. Well, perhaps that 
there should be some changes to that tax treatment, um, allow employers pay up to €2,000 to an employee in one of those vouchers. Okay, uh, the employee makes a tax saving on employer's PRSI. Uh, the worker ends up, you know, not having to pay PAYE, PRSI, etc., USC. And the money has to be spent in the local economy and will find its way back in very, very quickly. So I think we need to look at innovative ways like that. But the bottom line is that while we're in level five, it's hard to see what you can do in the way of stimulus. Uh, to be honest, uh, because, you know, the, the wherewithal to spend money is very, very limited. Um, I said in my talk earlier on that I believed that the level five approach is a very blunt instrument, uh, that there was no risk assessment involved. Um, you know, it, it, to me, it's absolutely nuts to force golf clubs to shut down um, to prevent somebody like me from going up into the Dublin mountains because it's outside 5K. Um, so we're all going to be pushed into public parks that are already teeming with people. So you'd have to think that the risk profile there would be much, much um, higher. So I, I, I think the whole approach, to be honest, has been pretty dreadful um, and I'm pretty disillusioned about it at the moment. And I don't think we've learned anything in the last seven or eight months about how to deal with uh, COVID. So the only strategy at this stage appears to be um, recurring rolling lockdowns in the hope that a vaccine will eventually rescue us. Um, I don't think that's the way we can run the economy, to be honest. Jim, that's an answer from heaven because that's exactly what we're looking for. For somebody who doesn't sit on the fence or chew his words when it comes to uh, the current approach, and I couldn't agree more with you. But we know consumer spending has been hammered, or sorry, consumer spending has been hammered, but also consumer sentiment is quite low at the moment. But I guess that poses the questions. There are other external issues that are obviously impacting us, like the American election, Brexit, and COVID. Uh, how do you think that's going to impact the foreign exchange rates between those various countries? Well, um, I, I think st sterling is obviously very vulnerable to um, a hard Brexit. Um, and it's certainly not built into the price at the moment because the markets have the same view as my gut instinct that a deal will be done and that a hard Brexit will be avoided. But if a hard Brexit is not avoided... Um, and Britain crashes out on the 1st of January, you would expect sterling to weaken significantly initially because it is going to do serious damage to the UK economy, whatever way you look at it. There's no doubt about it. And if you superimpose that on top of the ham-fisted manner in which Boris Johnson has handled the whole COVID, COVID crisis in the UK, you'd have to say sterling would be very vulnerable. And I'm being a two-handed economist here, Lorraine. On the other hand, if a Brexit deal is done, if Britain avoids the worst case scenario, I would expect to see sterling strengthen a little bit on the exchanges. So I, I've, I've felt for the last, since June 2016, that the path of sterling would be dictated by sentiment towards Brexit with a pretty binary choice, hard Brexit, bad for sterling soft Brexit, good for sterling. And that's, I think, exactly how it has unfolded over that period. And it remains the case. In terms of the dollar, um, I think the dollar looks very vulnerable at the moment on a whole range of fronts. Um, and, and OK, uh, the, the, why is it vulnerable? Well, it's, it's, it's vulnerable because the, the United States is running massive fiscal deficits at the moment. Uh, the United States, the whole management of COVID, um, the problems that it's creating within U.S. society, that they are all, and, and of course, the relationship with China, they are all bad for the dollar. So I think that initially, if Trump won the election, the dollar would probably strengthen a little bit. But I think it will be a temporary reprieve. And I would see the dollar being very, very vulnerable Um a, a little bit down the road. Um, a Biden victory, I think, ultimately should be good for the dollar uh, because I think Biden will have a much more conciliatory approach towards um, US international trade relations. 
Um, and I think he would try to rebuild the bridges, particularly the bridge between the Euro European Union and the United States. Because the one thing that I found very disillusioning about um, Trump's behavior was the fact that he was picking battles with and sniping at um, the United States' biggest allies in Western Europe, particularly countries like Germany. Um, I, th I think that is a mad strategy. And um, Biden definitely would roll back on some of that. I don't believe Biden would um, become much more conciliatory towards the Chinese for the simple reason that opinion polls show at the moment that over 70% of Americans think that Trump's approach to China is the correct one and that China m misbehaves um, on a whole range of fronts. So I'm not sure you'd see a massive reversal of that Chinese issue. But with Europe, I would expect to see the United, European Union and the United States um, starting to come back together in a more conciliatory manner again, which is good um, for the U.S. economy and it would be good for the dollar in my view. So you've heard it here first, no foreign exchange trading until the American election's out of the way and Brexit is done with and this period of volatility is over. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Joanne, if I could uh, pose a question to you. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to train 10% of the population. Uh, very ambitious. Uh, what, what stage of that journey are you on now? Whereabouts are you? Yeah, so it's to get 10% of the population engaged in Lyft. And in our first two years, it was all about proof of concept, building a strong team and getting good partner organizations behind us. So in our first two years, we engaged 6,000 people. Years three and four are all about scale. And we're just four months into year three now. And we engaged 6,000 people in our first two years. We've engaged nearly 5,000 in our first four months of year three. So in years three and four, we're going to engage 60,000 people. So the numbers are pretty easy to work out, actually. Lyft is a very... Um, uh, I hate to use the term, but it's a very viral model. It's very simple and easy to, to spread, um, but it is, uh, and so we will we will achieve those numbers. But it's not a, it's not just about the numbers, though, Connor. It is about the impact that we get. Um, and so far, um, the reports back from organisations about they can they can feel it in their organization when lift is being done like it makes a marked change to how people feel and how people uh, behave it's it's fantastic uh, thank you joanne you're a trained accountant so i i'm i hope you're on top of the numbers uh, but that's huge progress that you've made and congratulations and well done um i would just like to thank all our speakers uh owen laberty jim power joanne hessian and owen hanran who unfortunately wasn't able to join us um, Lorraine Higgins is going to stay around and put me on the spot, but before she does that, we're going to hear from Anka Herlock Unapower. Indeed, and um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, this has been an amazing uh, week of discussions that you've had, and uh, delighted to be able to tune in there to the last panel as well. Fantastic. Um, I suppose today I was asked to focus in on the idea of innovation in climate change and climate action, both locally here in Dunleary Rathdown and obviously nationally across Ireland. And I was thinking about this a lot. And I was thinking about where innovation is born from when it comes to tackling uh, some of the challenges that are ahead of us. And obviously, the last year has been incredibly difficult, um, but it has had a bit of a phenomenon in making us stop and rethink how we do and what we do. Um, and what I mean by this is, I, I suppose many of us already are feeling that sense of what it's like now to change our work-life balance, to work from home, um, to shift our patterns of commuting and not commuting. Um, and this is really important for when we consider how to approach climate action. Because here in Dunleary at Down, there was an impetus put upon us to sort of uh, tackle the challenges of COVID in terms of transport when we knew that we would have our public transport um, networks uh, round down to a certain degree. We had to come up with an idea and that was why we went forward so much with the walking and cycling initiatives which had the secondary aspect of hitting into our climate uh, targets and I think that was amazing having that opportunity to innovate 
um, and to trial something. And I think this is something so important going forward that when we think about things, that we are given that chance to trial out the innovation. So many of the people listening today will be aware of the work that's been ongoing in Blackrock, Dundrum, the coastal cycle route. All of this has been done in order to open up our networks and get people walking and cycling. Um, and this is incredible for our obviously climate action, but it's also got the other effect of opening up our businesses. So I think that's something that we need to keep up is that idea of innovation, of trialing, of trying things out, of giving it a, a sort of a run. We're also bringing in a lot of data uh, drive to this. So we've set up monitors to count how many people are cycling. We have an ongoing um, research by TUD on the new routes to see how many people are using them and what they're using them for. And again, this is a really important part of climate action innovation is to have that data and that knowledge going forward so that we know where things are going right and where things are going wrong. Um, I think that we also, when we're talking about innovation for tackling climate change, Something that we can always learn from is from nature, and we can also learn to reduce certain things. And that's here in Dunleary, something we've done very much is the reduction side and focusing in on making our uh, buildings much more energy efficient and bringing about energy efficient lighting. These are small things, they're not as perhaps as 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 giant an idea, but they are that little innovation that can keep things ticking over and reduce those needs, which is so important. And looking to nature at a national level, we're looking at developing a land use plan to where we store carbon, to where we tackle things such as floods um, and making sure that our water courses are, are um, up to scratch. And this is something that I think comes into my next idea with innovation is sharing ideas between local authorities, between nations. So something that will be very interesting going forward is if we look at the likes of uh, some of the UK initiatives when it comes to, um, to carbon storage and when it comes to water courses. We've seen the Shropshire Wildlife Trust that has brought meandering back into rivers, that's brought sort of little dams back into rivers, all of which has stopped down down river flooding and that's something that I'd like to see come in here with the course of the land use plan but something else that we've learned from in terms of um, innovating and learn from other countries is very much uh, Germany's Energiewende which has been this tremendous sort of absolute tour de force of renewable energy construction in Germany um, and a massive part of that focus has been on community-led energy. So where communities can invest in their energy resources themselves and they can reduce their energy costs and it brings jobs and momentum into communities, both rural and urban. And that sort of buy-in has allowed for that widespread um, uptake of renewable energy. And it's something that was um, ha is ongoing here. And Minister Ryan did mention it in September with the announcement of 82, I think, new uh, renewable projects uh, was that seven of them would be community-led. And again, these are all these things that we can learn, we can share, and we can bring about um, because there is such a huge huge challenge ahead of us when it comes to tackling climate change and it's going to require huge levels of changes both locally nationally and internationally of course um so i suppose like if i had to kind of surmise what i think are the things that we need to do that we need that time and opportunity and that sort of bravery to try out new things we need to think about where we can reduce so that we don't always have to create. And where we do create, we need to look to other countries and other people to see what they have to share. And in this sort of um, global situation that we find ourselves in now, where right now I'm talking to you from my kitchen and I don't know where everybody listening to me is sitting, we have never been so digitally connected um, 
that we can do that and that we can really share data and project ideas and analysis and all of those things that we need going forward. And I suppose before I finish, because I realize I, I am talking to um, to Sandyford Business District and to members of the business community, these innovations can have incredible knock-on impacts for businesses. Um, talking about the walking and cycling infrastructure that we're building in Europe, the cycling uh, tourism industry is actually bigger than the cruise ship tourist industry. It also employs roughly twice as many people. So that sort of thing can be incredibly impactful. It can also help to keep people in our towns and villages and getting them to shop local, which I know is something huge for us here. And we're in a desperately trying time right now. So we really need to pave the way as much as we can to get people to stay local and act local. Um, And things like with the, again, with the community energy projects, that's something that keeps people in the locality and it can be really good for businesses locally by reducing energy costs and energy needs. So I suppose, um, I think it's for people like the people who've been speaking here over the last few days and the people listening to make the time for these ideas and to push these ideas and to make them work for you and for others because we all need to come together to tackle climate change and to innovate in a way that is clever, active and sustainable. And I'll leave it at that. I don't want to hark on too much, but thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, it was great insight to, to, you know, to what's happening in terms of cycling and walking. And it's great to see the council embrace innovation and be proactive. So thank you very much for your time. Now it's over to uh, Lorraine Higgins, who's going to give me hopefully a light grilling. I think, Connor, at the end of a really, really long week, it would be very unfair of me to put you on the spot to too much of an extent. But in any case, this year has been obviously a huge success. There's been a record number of businesses who have registered for Innovation Week. And I guess, you know, it's gone from a one day event to a four day event, which is an enormous undertaking given the times we find ourselves in. So can you tell us a little bit about what went into this week and making it the success it is? Yeah, I'll do my best. Where do you start? Uh, normally we hold physical events. Uh, those physical events uh, you know, generally happen in Sandyford. Um, our, innovation week, our Innovation Week this year is normally a day or a morning. We would have somewhere between 250 and 300 guests uh, because of covid uh, the pandemic, that put a stop to physical events. So some bright spark in the office came up with uh, Innovation Week. Uh, so it's a, a four-day event. So we all thought it was a great idea. Um, one of the best things about it was we would have global reach uh, and be able to have uh, some speakers from all over the world contribute, whereas when it's a physical event, you're quite limited. Um, so... I could go on and go on and go on in terms of what was involved in, in, in bringing the event together, but it's just enormous. The infrastructure, the people involved, the time, the effort that's gone into it, the collaboration has been unbelievable. Uh, Dunley Rat Down have co-funded it. We're really grateful for that. It's just been completely mind-blowing. Mm. That it has. And you just touched on something there. One of the unique advantages of the current situation that we all find ourselves in is that people and international speakers could dial in from abroad, which is obviously was a huge addition to the lineup for Innovation Week. Are there any other ways you see that businesses have benefited from, um, from the week? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, for me, I was personally, I was a bit deflated coming into this. Um, the news is quite negative. Um, you know, I've seen businesses scale up, scale down, scale back up again, scale back down. Um, it's been very difficult, both mentally and physically on people. And then this event has sort of, it's uplifted me because I've seen, you know, it's driven home that the Irish people are so resilient. Um, the innovation happening in this country is extraordinary. Um, and I think we have the brain power, uh, the innovation to deal and tackle anything that's thrown our way. So um, look, embrace AI, you know, embrace innovation, you know, uh, take a minute, take these, if you can, use level five, use these next six weeks to take stock, you know, to take a break if you can and ask yourself what you can do differently, more efficiently and better. 
Great advice. Um, and I know there's been so many really, really good sessions over the course of the week. And it's possibly a little unfair of me to ask you, what was your high? Yeah. Um, look, there's been many highs, I suppose. Um, you know, the improvements in healthcare. Uh, that's, you know, that's been incredible in terms of, you know, it doesn't just start at the hospital. It continues on uh, through that patient journey and the care pathway when, when the patient is, you know, is outside hospital recovering. Uh, we've seen, you know, some very innovative companies and how they've reacted. Uh, and again, it's back down to, you know, resilience, collaboration and innovation and what this is event is about. It's, there, there isn't any sort of standout highs. The whole event for me has been just unbelievable, mind-blowing. You know, you look at the Singularity University, um, um, high-level stuff, you know, these people can see into the future. Um, and it's, uh, you know, they've... They've communicated it in a way that someone like me can understand. Like, it's just unbelievable. So we leave here equipped with knowledge as to what will happen next, which yes, is yeah, yeah, a, a fantastic yeah. gift to get. So what would be your key takeaway from the week? Oh, Apart key, from that one. Yeah, my key takeaway from the week is that uh, we're living in the future. Um, you know, John Shaw, quantum computing. Like, we've all discussed um, the pandemic uh, how it's accelerated remote working, but it hasn't. It has to a certain extent. There's always been remote working, you know, sales people out the road. You know, they you know they they've always worked remotely. You know, people have been selling on horseback, you know, since the beginning of time. But um, I suppose uh, John Shaw brought it home for me when he put, you know, a time frame on it. We're in 2025, uh, and I, we we haven't spoken um, like that uh, previously. You know, we haven't spoken about the future. We've, we've always looked back, but we're, we're now living in the future, which is extraordinary. That's it, my biggest take from, from, uh, from, from the event this week. It's a really, really good one because I think people have had time to take stock, you know, learn from the experience and expertise of a number of speakers yeah. that you've managed to bring together for this event. So I guess that just begs the question, what next for Sandy Fair Business District? What other exciting plans have you in store? Oh, there's um, loads, loads of exciting plans. Um, like we'll hope to next year hold a bigger and better innovation week. Um, you know, we'll build on this um, hot off the press. Um, you know, agreed probably about a, two hours ago is uh, and we're having our awards event uh, come hell or high water next year and we're going to recognize uh, companies and individuals who've shown resilience and adaptability in Sandy for Business District. So that'll be happening, I think it's April. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, and other things, like we'll continue to support business uh, during the pandemic, after the uh, pandemic. You know, we, we campaigned for, you know, the commercial rate waiver. You know, we submitted a quite a robust uh, budget submission. Um, so we're going to continue su to support businesses and our stakeholders, that's really important. On a lighter note, um, well, it's not a lighter note, but our Spend in Sandyford campaign, you know, we're going to be strong. We're going to push that between now and Christmas. Uh, on a lighter note, we'll, we'll have you know, Christmas lights and a virtual Santa. Uh, so Santa has, uh, has embraced AI. Uh, <laughs> so if Santa can do it, we should all do it. But yeah, no, the, the future is bright. You know, it, it's promising for 2021, um, and I hope to be part of it. Fantastic. What, a, what an important message as well as we're entering the second phase of lockdown in this country that people spend in Sandyford and that they buy nearby. And I think that's one of the big takeaways as well from this week, if everybody could make a concerted effort to do so over the next period of time. Thank you, Connor. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Lorraine, everybody that has contributed far and wide, the questions that came in, the people who uh, viewed us over the last four days. Um, I need to single out one or two people. Um, this would not have happened without uh, a number of board members, Sheila Moore, Connor Bofin, uh, Jared Corcoran, uh, Babylon Events, Sarah Mortar from Babylon Events, uh, obviously Dunley Ratdown uh, County Council, UCD um, for providing the venue, and the amazing people at Creative Technology who are all behind the camera uh, making this uh, uh, as, as easy and as seamless as possible. I know we've had our challenges, but they could have been a lot worse. Uh, so sincere uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's been involved in this event. And I look forward to uh, uh, 
Uh, seeing you all over the, the coming months, and hopefully we'll, have a, we'll be able to have a physical coffee uh, in Sandyford Business District in 2021. So thank you to everybody, and stay safe. Thank you.